Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. So my name is Howard Barron, and I am a member of the Insurance Committee for the National Chrysler Retirement Organization. And here, along with me from the uh, other members of the Insurance Committee, are uh, John Kaiser, who is in the lobby, Sherry Jelnek, um, has very graciously provided us a lot of the refreshments today, and uh, Paul Grit is right over here. So thank you very much for coming, both uh, in person here and on um, the internet. We are here to uh, do our annual presentation on uh, moving to, as you age uh, in from your Chrysler insurance into age 65, whether for you or your spouse, we're here to kind of help you through that transition uh, as you uh, move into this grand new world of uh, Medicare. So uh, our presentations today, there will be a number of us doing presentations. Uh, we'll start off with Paul Gritt. We'll be doing one on um, just kind of an overview of Social Security and Medicare. Then John Kaiser will give uh, two presentations, one on the difference between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Then we're going to go to have a, a brief break. Then John will then continue about Medicare Part D, which is the drug plan uh, through Medicare. And then I will give two presentations, uh, one of which is a little bit more specific about Chrysler or Stellantis or whatever the, the name currently is of the corporation, their benefits that they provide us as uh, retirees. And then uh, a final presentation on the different consultants that are there to potentially help you make this transition uh, as painless as possible. Uh, so um, some logistics here. Again, we will be taking a break in the middle. Uh, there are restrooms out in the uh, lobby here. If you go out through the main door and turn to the left and then turn to the right, there are restrooms there. Again, there are food over on the uh, side here. If uh, don't you know, hesitate to... Uh, uh, if you feel a little peaked, go you know, grab a bite during the presentation or during the break. Uh, we will be running in through lunchtime, through about 1.30 or so. Um, and then one thing in terms of we will be taking questions after each one of the presentations, but we would appreciate if you could hold your questions until the end of each presentation, and then we'll have Q&A for that section, and then move on to the next section, and then we'll have a general Q&A at, as we wrap up the entire uh, program. So again, thank you so much for coming. And um, to kick us off here, we're going to start off with a general overview of Social Security and Medicare. And our presenter will be uh, the esteemed Paul Gritt. Uh, good morning. As uh, Howard said, my name is Paul Gritt. I retired in 2008 from engineering and have been on the uh, committee since then. Okay, I want to start with Social Security, which is a little more straightforward than the Medicare. So let's look at milestones. The earliest you can receive Social Security is 62 years of age, <clears throat> but if you take it at 62, your, your benefits are basically reduced about 25% from what's called your full Social Security payment. Every month you wait after your 62nd birthday, your benefits go up and they max at age 70. So no increase after age 70. Now there's something called full retirement age. And the significance of that is if you decide to do some work after you retire, if you're below your full retirement age, and you make more than $19,580 a year, you will lose $1 of Social Security benefit for every $2 you make over that amount. And your full retirement age is based on when you were born. If you were born in uh, from 43 to, to 54, it's 66. And if you were born as late as, uh, where are we here? 1960 at 67. <laughs> yeah. 
As a matter of fact, this this should already be up there by today. I'll show you a, a chart on the next page, which will give you a little more detail on the full retirement age. So now the question is, okay, what do you have to do? Whoops. Okay, two months before you turn 62, you should go online and log in to the uh, Social Security website. And there's an option there that shows you to you can put in your birth date and your name and Social Security number, and it'll tell you exactly what your benefits are going to be. And if that's a problem, there's a toll-free number you can call and do the same thing. This is the full retirement age, a little more detail. And as you can see, if you're under full retirement age, the limit is 19,560. The year <clears throat> that you reach full retirement age, you can earn up to 51,000. And once you reach full retirement age, you can earn as much money as you want. Social Security doesn't care. So just something to know if you're going to do a little uh, consulting or part-time work or whatever you're going to do or work for another company after you retire. Okay, so what are the major takeaways? I think the key takeaway is that don't just automatically start taking Social Security at 62 <clears throat> when you're first eligible. Look into the numbers, look at your own financial situation and try to make an informed decision. The longer you wait, the more money you get. Um, so it depends on your individual financial situation. So explore all your options. As I say, there's a link here. You go to that website, you put in your information, and you can put in your wife's or spouse's information, and it'll tell you exactly how much you're going to get at each age. You and your spouse are sort of independent of each other. That is, you can each take your Social Security at a different age. And the only connection between the two is if one spouse has a significantly higher, or had a significantly higher income so that their Social Security benefit, let's say their Social Security benefit is $2,000 a month, <clears throat> and the other spouse had a job that didn't pay that kind of money and their Social Security benefit is only going to be $800 a month, the lower spouse can take one half of the higher spouse's Social Security instead of their own, whichever is greater. Okay, what's the best age to retire? This is just a simple bar chart. This comes right from the government website, but they're just using as an example, let's say your full benefit is $1,000 a month. If you took it at 62, you'd get 750. If you wait until 70, you get 1320. So that gives you an idea of, of how it works. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about healthcare benefits and Medicare. It's a little more complicated. Okay, as you may already know, the, the month you turn 65, all of your healthcare benefits from FCA Solantis stop. Drugs, medical, vision, hearing, everything just stops cold. So what do you have to do? <clears throat> if you're not already taking Social Security, then about three months before you turn 65, you want to go online to ssa.gov and sign up for Parts A and B for Medicare. Or you can call that phone number and do it over the phone. At the same time, you want to start exploring your options for supplemental coverage <clears throat> because, as you may know, Social Medicare only pays about 80% of what the charges are for most medical procedures, and there's deductibles and copays, so you want to have some additional coverage to take care of that part of it. Now, two months before your 65th birthday, by that time, you should have done your research and you want to sign up for whatever your supplemental plans you've chosen, which is uh, either an Advantage plan or a Medigap plan and a Part D for drugs. 
And you want to do it two months before your 65th because the whole thing has to go through the government and you want to give it enough time so that the day you turn 65, everything is already in place. <clears throat> now, if you're already taking Social Security when you turn 65, the government's going to send you a postcard. And basically what the postcard says is, do you want to opt out of Medicare Part A or and or B? And the answer for 99% of us is, no, you don't. Just throw the postcard away. And I'll, I'll tell you later, there are a few exceptions when you wouldn't do that, but we'll get into that at the end. So now you do the same thing that we did before. If, by the way, if you didn't get that postcard, call this number and find out why you didn't get the postcard. And again, as we said before, start exploring your options for supplemental coverage. And again, there's going to be a lot more information about this coming. Same thing again, uh, two months before, make your final decisions and sign up for whatever your supplemental coverage is so that it's fully in place the day you turn 65. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk about the details of how Medicare is structured. There are four parts, A, B, C, and D, and then Medigap, also referred to as Medicare su Supplemental Insurance. Now, A and B come directly from the federal government, and C and D and Medigap come from private insurance companies, which are regulated by the federal government. Medicare does not include drugs, dental, vision, or hearing, although Congress is working on some of that. Okay, now again, all of these slides are on the website. You don't have to take notes. This again comes right from the government website. Part A is basically hospital, and part B is basically going to see your doctor or your specialist or or any of the other items. Okay. There's a Part B deductible, $233 in 2022. After you meet your deductible, Medicare pays about 80% uh, of most of the charges. And most doctor services are also covered. Doctor, the doctor must accept Medicare. Most doctors do. There are some who don't. Covers outpatient therapy, durable medical goods like wheelchairs and stuff. Now, here's a, a kind of a good news, bad news thing. If you're lucky enough <clears throat> to have retirement or have an annual income greater than $91,000 if you're single or $182,000 if you're filing joint, there's an additional charge on top of your regular Medicare Part B. The regular is for 2022 is $170.10 a month. But if you make more than this amount of money, there's a charge on top of that. And the more you make over that, the bigger that charge is. It's not negotiable. There's nothing you can do about it. It's based on your prior year's tax returns and when you get your letter from the uh, Social Security, it says, yep, this is what your IRMA is. Like I said, it's called IRMA, I-R-M-A-A. -A. Okay, Part C is called an Advantage Plan. These are becoming more and more popular. The concept behind this is, instead of having your, so your Medicare card and then a supplemental card for medical and another card for Part D drugs, you just have this Advantage card, and it covers all of that in one lump. And they also, they, a lot of sales, you could probably see this on TV, there are a lot of advertisements for these Advantage plans. And there's a presentation coming later today that's gonna go into quite a bit of detail about the pros and cons of Advantage plans. But even if you take an Advantage plan, you still have to pay the, model, the Medicare Part B premium, which normally just gets automatically deducted out of your Social Security check. 
Now, Part D is prescription drugs. Regular Medicare does not cover drugs. Advantage plans usually include drugs, but if you're not doing an Advantage plan, you need to get a separate Part D policy. These are by private insurance companies. They vary tremendously depending on what drug you need, what company you buy them from. One of the good things about them is that you can change Part D plans every year if you want to with no penalty. And that could be really advantageous because the premiums change every year, the drugs they cover change every year, what they charge for drugs change every year. For instance, I just changed my wife from WellCare to Cigna Part D because <clears throat> you can go, there's a website and John's gonna explain that to you. You put in all the drugs you're taking and it'll tell you exactly what it's gonna cost you for the year and different plans have significantly different charges. When I changed my wife from WellCare to Cigna, the premiums were lower and the total annual cost was half. So it's worth reviewing every year. Okay, then we have Medigap, also called officially Medicare Supplemental Insurance. And it covers most or all of Part A and Part B that they don't cover. Their standard plans, the standard plans are designated by the government by letters, A, B, D, G, K, et cetera. The key concept here is, let's say you're looking at a plan A and there's, let's say, five companies in your area that offer a plan A Medigap. The actual benefits that they have to give you are exactly the same regardless of the company by law. So the key there is, well, gee, you pick the company that gives me the cheapest premium. The only thing you gotta watch for is that as you get older, the premiums go up. They go up by age and they go up by time because medicine keeps going up and you're getting older. So when you're analyzing which company to go with, you wanna look not only at what you're paying at 65, but what you're paying at 70 or 75. Uh, another key concept is when you first become eligible for Medicare, when you turn 65, there's a seven month window under what's called guaranteed issue. And that means no matter how sick you are, no matter what kind of pre-existing conditions you have, Within that seven month period, if you wanna sign up for a company, they have to accept you. After that seven month period, it's not quite the same thing. <clears throat> Medigap policies may require Medicare underwriting, so if you have serious chronic issues, you may have a problem switching plans. Okay, again, this is all on the website, so don't worry about your eye chart, but these are all the different plans. Uh, the most comprehensive is G. It's also the highest premium, of course. And there's several other different options. And this just, again, all on a website, so don't worry about it. Again, right from the government, it's all standardized. Now let's talk about premiums, just to give you some examples. So here's three different plans. Um, and this gives you an idea of what the premiums are like and they'll probably go up every year. So here's from three different companies that I pulled off the web. And you can see that when you're 65, let's look at plan G. So 127, 130, 130, it's all about the same. But by the time you get to be 75, you've got $175, 210 and 205. So there's a significant difference depending on which company you go to as you get older. Okay, so you basically have two paths you can take. <clears throat> you can go with original Medicare, which will be part A and B, get a Medigap policy, and get a part D policy to cover your drugs. Or you can go with a Medicare Advantage plan, 
which will combine A, B, and D on a single package. The common elements are you still have to sign up for A and B. You still have to pay your Part B premium. And again, if you have a high monthly income, you get hit with this IRMA, which affects your um, Medicare Part B premium, and it affects your Medicare Part D premium. And it's not negotiable. So again, what are the, what are the differences? Okay, original Medicare, you go to any doctor or hospital that accepts Medicare, there's no networks. Then you have a Medigap and a Part D. So there's usually no co-pays for hospital and doctor services. And the monthly premiums are usually, are definitely higher than an Advantage plan. An Advantage plan, you go to the provider network, in network, out of network, your coverage isn't as good. Those plans here in Southeast Michigan are pretty broad and, and the networks are pretty big. So that's not necessarily that big of a problem. There are co-pays. The premiums are almost always lower than Medigap. And they usually throw in some extra goodies, a little vision or hearing benefits as an enticement. Now, just to give you a, a personal uh, example of, of how that might work, uh, back when I first went on uh, Medicare, I took a Humana Advantage plan. And then about a year later, I had to have some surgery on my left shoulder, uh, fairly elaborate. And so I was in Beaumont, had a shoulder specialist do the surgery. And the whole thing, by the time I, I kept me overnight, I think one day, maybe two. But the whole thing, the, the doctor, the hospital, the anesthesiology, all of that, I think it cost me about $250 out of pocket. But shoulders have need a lot of rehab. So I had to go to physical therapy three times a week and it was a copay of $35. So I was paying $105 a week for about two and a half or three months. Now, a few years later, uh, I had my left, by that time I had switched to a Medigap policy and uh, I had my left hip replaced at Beaumont again, hip specialist. It's a pretty elaborate operation. I list price, believe it or not, is like 50 grand. My total out of pocket, including one night at the hospital was $8.50, which was for the television in my room. Uh, I then went for some rehab for a few weeks out of pocket, zero. So now, of course, the Medigap policy I was on was quite a bit more than the Advantage plan, but that gives you an idea of, depending what you need, which way might be more advantageous. Okay, this, new, this book just came out, the 2003 book. It's about that thick. You can go to the website. They will mail you one if you want, or you can just download it as a PDF and it tells you everything you ever wanted to know about Medicare. There's also a bunch of YouTube videos about Medicare, and that's the uh, link to it. Although if you just go to YouTube and probably type in Medicare, you'll get, there's just tons of it. A lot of it is from individual companies, so it's a law of an advertisement, but some of it's from the government but there's just a ton of information out there if you want to do that. The government has now come up with an app. And the idea behind the app is you can see what's covered and what's not covered. I'll be honest with you, I haven't downloaded the app myself and tried it, but it's free. And you can get it, you know, from your for your Google phone or your uh, iPhone by going to the appropriate store and just typing in Medicare. Okay, there are some gotchas. The first one is you want to be sure you sign up for a Part D or an Advantage plan at least two months before you turn 65 so it all gets set up. 
Again, Medicare does not cover long-term care. It does cover skill, skilled nursing, which is a different thing. If you delay, let's say you, you'd say, gee, I'm in pretty good health, and I really don't want to pay the $170 a month for Medicare Part B, and I don't really take any drugs, so I don't really need a Part D. So I'm just not going to sign up for those. Don't do that. And the reason you don't want to not do that, double negative, is <laughs> for every month you don't sign up after your 65th birthday, there is a penalty. And the penalty, again, every month it, the penalty goes up. And the penalty, once you start that, is forever. So if you delay signing up for a year or two and then decide to sign up, you may be paying 20 or $30 a month more than you would have if you'd signed up originally, and there's nothing you can do about it, and you can't undo it. So you don't want to delay. Changing, remember I said, the first seven months, you become eligible, you have guaranteed issue. No matter how sick you are, pre-existing condition, doesn't matter, they have to take you. But after that, let's say you're in either an Advantage plan or a Medigap plan and you decide you want to change to a different Medigap plan, you are subject to medical underwriting. So if you have some chronic conditions or some bad previous conditions, the, other, the next the company you want to change to may not accept you. It's not guaranteed. I, I switched from one Medigap plan to another, but I didn't have any chronic diseases or, or conditions, so I was able to do it, but don't assume you would. The other thing to think about is that some of the Medigap policies don't cover you when you're outside the United States. So that's something to think about if you do a lot of traveling. The last item, and it's, it's kind of a small item, but I had to throw it in. <clears throat> It used to be if you were in an auto accident and you were on Medicare, then Medicare was the primary insurance coverage. But that's changed here in Michigan, and now your auto policy is primary. So theoretically, once you go on Medicare, your auto policy premium might go up a little bit. I haven't heard of that happening too many, but technically and theoretically, that's possible. Okay, remember at the beginning I said, if you get that postcard about signing up for Part B, just, yes, I'm going to sign up, you throw the postcard away. So there are some times when you don't want Part B. The most common would be if your spouse is working for another company and they have medical coverage that includes you. So that means you have what's called credible coverage and in that case, you can delay signing up for Part B and Part D, and you won't in, you won't accrue those penalties as long because you were you had coverage. They want to make sure you have some kind of coverage. So in that case, you wouldn't sign up for Part B. If you're getting your medical coverage from the VA, the VA sends you a letter every year saying that yeah, you have credible coverage through the VA. So again, you don't have to sign up for B and you won't get the penalty. And the last one, although I don't think it applies to, to too many of crisis retirees, is if you're on Medicaid. Here's all a bunch of numbers. Again, don't have to write this down. This is all on the website, uh, ncro.org. And one of the tabs is Medicare and Social Security. Is click on that tab and there's all of this information, this whole presentation is there and all the other presentations you're gonna see. Okay, thank you for your attention. Questions? Wait, yeah, wait till the microphone come to you because, <clears throat> because otherwise the people who are signed in on the webinar won't be able to hear you. <clears throat> Why do you mind 
was going to have rotator cuff surgery in uh, February this year. He mm -hmm. had Medicare C. Week before that, another buddy called and says, check to see whether anesthesiologist is covered. He called up. It wasn't covered. He canceled the surgery, and he went with another hospital that had it covered. Now, why do hospitals pull this stuff called ghost or phantom charges that they don't cover something that's supposed to be covered and you get stuck with it? Well, I, you know, I don't know what the politics are there, but obviously some anesthesiologists, you know, just haven't signed up underneath that network. Hello? There was another question here. <clears throat> uh, one of your pages, you compared... Medicare and Medigap on the left, and you had Advantage plans on the right. Right. An Advantage plan does not include the Medigap uh, coverage. True? Well, it, it it's supposed to take the place of Medigap. Okay. So that's because you, you, you showed A B, and C, A, B, and D, I think. So it yeah. does. All right. The Advantage plans, too, are they, are they on, is it an annual enrollment? You do, are both these always an annual enrollment? You it's automatic. So if you want to change, is there like a, uh, a time of the year you have to change? Yeah, okay. John, John has got a whole presentation coming okay. comparing the two that's going to answer a lot of your questions. Just because a lot of questions come up like that. Okay, is that it? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention.